And as you breathe, see if you can feel your breath going in and out. Notice your breathing. If your attention is drawn to other parts of your body, give them your attention and then return to noticing your breath in and out. If your attention is drawn to thoughts, give your thoughts some kindness for a moment and then return to noticing your breath. Simply let yourself breathe and exist. Let yourself imagine a community, the ones that love you are around you. See them all around you in an intersecting web. And you are at the center of that web. Notice others that are further away. Imagine that you are able to rely on everyone in your community. Breathe in and out. That you are beloved by everyone just as you are. Let yourself be a flower unfolding within the love of your community. And in the next few minutes, we will go into silence together. as we are surrounded by the love of each other.
Slowly bring yourself back. Bring yourself back to the community, small but mighty. Feel your feet on the ground, holding you up. Begin to open your eyes. Stretch. Look about. And let's just take a moment and say hello to each other. Let's look around and offer everyone a, an ancient namaste. Namaste, namaste, namaste. Namaste, Dave. Namaste. Namaste, Bella. Um, today I'll be talking, it's kind of a little bit of a long talk, so I may be talking quicker to shorten it. And then I also have an activity, and I'm not sure how long the activity will be. We only have a few people here today, a mere hundred. So I'm guessing it will be a little quicker. And we also have some people on Zoom that I will pair up in breakout rooms. So I'll be leaving the seat when we do the activity to help our Zoom person. And then we'll um, meet again as a community, and then we'll have a short discussion about what we just did, about the activity. Then I'll do my con conclusion, and then we'll close the service, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna start by, I used to believe that spirituality was solely an inside job. And I know this, this church and focuses on that, and there is so much truth in that, but it's not always true for me. And I'm, I'm gonna discuss that, why it's not always true for me. I used to believe that the way to God, to be a channel to the Christ energy, was solely an inward journey that I had to take alone. And I no longer believe this um, as, I, as I'm growing. And that the outer journey through connections, through community, we open up to the courage to trust and move to the inward spiritual journey. I'm gonna move this a little bit. I can move it back there. And so what do I mean by the inward journey? Well, I mean, perhaps just what Pat was saying earlier today uh, during the mini lesson, just imagining the light is with you and feeling the comfort of that. That would be a wonderful example of the inward journey. Um, other ideas is facing memories, perhaps. In my case, I do that where love was not, and then rescuing those parts. Perhaps the inward journey is learning to let go of my expectations and my perfectionism. Perhaps it's the inward journey of connecting to the internal qualities of love, joy, peace, freedom, wisdom. And in doing so, at last, I recognize myself. And maybe the inward journey is embracing my humanity as I let in the love that others are willing to share with me. And that's a big one for me. And so what do I mean by the outward journey? Well, for me, the outward journey is when I am in fellowship with everyone here. The outward journey is connecting with others through intimacy and vulnerability and just being myself without hiding. The outward journey is expressing myself fully and freely, not holding back, not playing small. The outward journey is about having compassion and understanding for others and to seek that. I also believe that healing is a quality of our spiritual journey that is both inward and outward. So, so I want to start with a, um, a, a story. Uh, long ago, I was hiking with a group of persons, and one person hurt his shoulder, and me and the other guys agreed to help carry his pack and his gear. And this person said no that he said that everyone should be responsible to carry their own gear. And if they cannot carry their own gear, they had no business being out here. 
And that way of thinking was a concern for me. One thing, he could have actually hurt his shoulder even more. And so, um, and luckily that didn't happen. But the question I ask is, do we live in a culture that identifies with rugged individualism to overcome adversary, adversity on the strength of our own self-reliance? Basically, to man up. And so, uh, I remember when I was 14 years old, I played football for um, a, a city team, well, outside of Boston, and it was called Pop Warner Football. And we had a winning team that year. We had a winning year. So we traveled from Boston to Pennsylvania to play another winning team out that was located outside of Pittsburgh. And so we paired up with the members of that team. And they appeared to be sissies to me and to our team. They seemed to be naive in comparison to the tougher, street-wise kids of Boston. Um, we were bigger, we outweighed them. I thought we were meaner, we were tougher. And during our stay there, when, the, when their parents were not looking, we taught them how to smoke, we taught them how to play poker for money, and we taught them how to cuss. And we bragged about some of the money that we won. However, on the football field, those sissies kicked our butts. Um, and I learned that winning had nothing to do with being tough. It had everything to do with being bonded at the level of the heart. And their team was bonded. They were sharing their feelings. They were open with each other. On my team, we were too tough to share our, fail to share our feelings. Also, their parents were involved. Our parents were not involved. They uplifted, they uplifted each other and cheered each other on. We pretended it did not matter to be cheered on. They played together, played hard, played smarter, were physically tougher on the field. They talked to each other on the field. They were creative. Their, communica their communications were way better on the field, and they outwitted us in almost every play. And so that was a lesson for me, that their bond, their emotional connection was their toughness. And so I'm thinking about the pioneers, that our society sometimes identifies, in my belief, with a myth that the pioneers built this land on rugged individualism, that we blazed trails into the West and overcame adversity on the strength of their own self-reliance. And I, I uh, discovered that that wasn't true. In my research, I discovered that the women of those times had extensive social networks and that their church groups helped each other's helped each other and other families. And there's a historian named Mark um, John Mac Farragay who described living on the frontier as a community experience, that everyone was sharing their work, haying, corn husking, butchering, harvesting, threshing the wheat, participating in, long, in log rolling games. It was all a communal affair that they shared their tools and their wagons openly. And when a family needed a barn, the community pulled together and raised the barn in one weekend. And the armors still live this way. So the conditions in those days were very dire, and the elements had so many variables that being in community with each other was more effective for survival in comparison to making it alone. And so the pioneers helped each other and leaned on each other to survive. And I think of the beauty of a community of that. Um, and also the government, I mean, who knew? The government also created a sense of community. Uh, they created the Pony Express, purchased land and territories, and gave or sold that land to settlers at a, at a loss. Uh, and so the government also funded thousands of projects to support the settlers. And I remember Jack Castell, I don't know if you remember this, but he was a, it was about 30 years ago, he was a renowned underwater explorer. And he said, a man alone is in bad company. And that quote has always stuck with me. 
And so I wonder if our society, our Western society, hides behind the false sense of individualism and self-reliance, that we are a people who look good on the outside, but at the cost of a sea of loneliness on the inside. And so I think of the 12-step programs now, you know, which I have been involved in for probably over 30 years, and that sometimes we talk about the addict who was a protector, who made agreements from a time when love was not there. And, you know, these agreements are our defenses to protect us from being vulnerable um, from a time when love was not present. So it's kind of like when a person slaps your hand, the next day that person may appear nice, but, you know, you're always looking, is he going to slap my hand again, day after day? And so uh, the addict uh, is always looking out for that, always looking uh, to protect ours from that, that, that hand slapping. And so 12-step communities are a catalyst for safety, where a deeper, healthier connections are experienced. And that the healing is the addict coming out, that protector, coming out, ourselves coming out from behind the shame and learning to trust the love within the 12-step community. And when that happens, the Christ energy begins to flow, that a new joy and the creativity are at hand. And this is part of the spiritual awakening that kind of comes from the outwardness, that comes from the outward connections that help us um, settle our nervous system down so that we can go inwards more easily. Um, and for me, it also means understanding that I'm not alone. And so the word change really means, from my perspective, changing directions towards love. And so there's another person named Sarah Payton, who is a neuroscience educator and the author of the book, Your Resident Self. And she teaches that we are made for connection, that children and adults who did not have loving connections for long durations, who have had relationships with trauma, um, tend to have poor health on all health markers, their immune system, heart, lung issues, they have brain functioning issues, emotional resilient issues, more stress across the board. And because of the stress hormones that are released when they are remembering the times when they were not loved, it has a big toll on their bodies and their life. And that amygdala that is holding that has no sense of time. It does not know that that time has passed. So we need to talk to that amygdala and kind of remind it, hey, no, that was a long time ago. Let's, uh, let's, let's be here. And, and to come here and now is also part of that, um, that the spiritual practice coming in in that moment. And so Sarah explains that the amygdala, sometimes referred to, referred to as the fear center in our brain, which holds the stress of alarmed loneliness, fight, flight, freeze, and please, can be soothed through loving connections. And the good news is that the fibers that are the most neoplastic in our brain, that means they can grow and regrow and reform, are in the prefrontal cortex of our brain, which means that at any age, we can build neurons and paths to that amygdala with caring accompaniment and warm connection from others. So our prefrontal cortex can build fibers of attachment that reach towards and calms the amygdala. And kind of, that's why I say that the outward journey of connection and community and that healing is also part of our spiritual journey. And that, that inward and the outward journey are sometimes both needed. And so as we eternalize uh, the safe regard from others, we build safety in ourselves. Our brain physically changes. We eternalize loving people and they become us. They become part of us. In other words, we carry them with us. We carry those who are kind, patient, and loving, and who can, and then what's the benefit? We then can move, or I should say I can, move through the world with more ease and confidence and fulfillment. And that is such a spiritual thing for me, that we can meet up with our full humanness in the inward spiritual journey now has a better chance 
um, because we have more courage to go in. We, have, we are more relaxed and more reflective so that we can go in. We have more tolerance for the stillness instead of always having to move to calm ourselves down. And so I think of this church, I think this church is poised for that community. Um, I see this personally in the board members where we place a high value on loving connection, it seems, above all else. And I love that. I like that. I'm not used to that, but I'm getting used to it. <laughs> and that joy comes from these connections, that joy is expansive, and that we need each other to expand with our joy. It is not and is this not an outward journey that's spiritual? To laugh with another person, to expand with someone else's joy. According to Sarah Payton, um, the most common um, reasons for, for trauma and unhealthy connections, or the most common consequences of that, is to not allow yourself to dream and hope so that we will never be heartbroken again. So there's that protective element. That it is often an unconscious agreement we make with ourselves when there is relationship trauma, either as an adult or a child. And so we make a promise to ourselves not to hope, not to invest ourselves emotionally, not to reach for connection, not to love, in order to save ourselves from pain. And so, and to save ourselves from the memories of our past or the memories of pain, where we were not hurt, where we were hurt, where we were not understood, where we were not seen and loved. And this is true for every age. So let's be a community, and I believe we're becoming, becoming this community. I think we are this community where we can share our hopes with each other where we can um, share our dreams with each other, where we can catch and mirror back our joy and all the eternal qualities of God, peace, kindness, hope, and consideration, belonging, intimacy, safety, vulnerability, belonging, meaning, wisdom. You know, these things are forever. They're always accessible to us. They're always right here. And, you know, how do we tap into that and share that? Someone else said, um, you cannot heal relationships that have trauma in them, either from an, as a, a child or an adult, that you cannot heal from that by just going inward. She said, it is not possible to heal past relationships where there was no love presence for long durations outside of relationships, that we need relationships to heal that. And that healing cannot be completed unless there is someone outside of ourselves who will love us, just as we are. And so now I have uh, a, a unique inward journey, and I, and I say that, I've had some unique inward journeys that just didn't cut it. I mean, I still need people to love me. And in these inward journeys that I've had, I'll share a little bit, uh, I call it the place that's, that's right here. And um, there was a sublime knowing that I'm connected to everything. There was so much incredibly peace. There was an aliveness and beauty within the trees, knowing that the trees were seeing me as beautiful and that the Native Americans had it right all along. We missed that one. And that um, I became a witness to an awareness that saw me perfect and beautiful and magnificent just the way I am. Brought me to my knees. The only one that was arguing about it was me. You see, it wasn't enough that I needed Virginia, Sunrise, Dan, Pat, Luann, uh, I needed everyone else here, uh, Dan, to see me beautiful. I just needed that for my own growth and for my own healing and to allow myself to express myself fully and freely. 
to be me. And so the eternal, the eternal qualities of God, intimacy, trust, warmth, peace, joy, sharing, are manifested through our communities as it is in heaven. And so if there is conflict, let, the, let us see what our best interest is. Let's agree to decide what to do about conflict together. Um, let us avoid, if we can, going into a fight or, or a competitiveness between two points of view, who was right, who was wrong, because relationships are about the and. Communities are about the and. It's about you and me working together, working this out. It is, um, the, it is about letting our thoughts and our emotions be seen and heard and to commit to having each other's best interest in mind. And so with that end in mind, I want to introduce you to Aunt Nelda and Uncle Roberto. Aunt Nelda and Uncle Roberto have been married for, I think, 30 years. And Uncle Roberto is an orderly person who likes a tidy house. Everything has its place and must be clean. Aunt Nelda, however, is very spontaneous. She is an artist who leaves her dishes unwashed and the sink filled with paintbrushes. Aunt Ro Uncle Roberto complains, you are inconsiderate, you're messy and selfish and only think of yourself. Does this sound familiar with anyone? Has anyone ever thought this about someone else? No, I'm, am I, I like Taylor when he says, am I the only one who's had these experiences? I'm feeling a little lonely now. <laughs> and Aunt Nelda complains about Uncle Roberto. You don't understand me. I need to follow my inspirations. I need to paint and I can't be bogged down by cleaning all the time. And when the ins inspiration comes, I need to go and answer that call, whatever I'm involved in. And, and after painting, sometimes I'm too tired to clean and pick up the house. And so they realized they were in conflict and that something external was going on, but something internal, something spiritual that wanted to be expressed through them was not able to be expressed between them. And so there was a longing to be understood and uh, a longing to understand what was going on, but also how much they cared about each other. And that Aunt Nelda and Uncle Wilberta said to each other that their connection is more important than the discord. And so they tried to understand each other and made a list of what they valued. And they wanted to acknowledge what was alive in each person, what they valued. They wanted to connect to what each other person was valuing. And so that list is available on your chair. Nelda valued was sponta being spontaneous. She valued freedom and flexibility. And she wanted to be accepted for who she was, for that creative spark. And she also needed help to clean. And uh, Uncle Roberto looked at that and said, oh, I understand now. I understand. And Uncle Roberto then shared his list. I want order. I really desire consistency and time, timeliness, timeliness. And, and I get a sense of security in an ordered home. And I feel more relaxed and peaceful when everything is in place. And Aunt Nelda said, oh my gosh, I never knew this. Why didn't we discuss this 30 years ago? We've been fighting for 30 years. And so now they came to an impasse. What do they do? Well, I'm going to bring this to you guys. So we have those desires, those values, those wants, that needs. And the exercise is, I want you to take a moment. Think about how all of those needs and values can be satisfied. What strategies can they use to meet all of those needs? 
And I want you to think of that for about four minutes or three minutes alone. And then I'm going to pair you up. And I'm going to pair the Zoomers up too, uh, so that they can be in their room and to discuss about it, to discuss it. And then we're going to come together as a community and create a proposal on what are some of the best ways where my uncle and aunt can meet those needs so that they can all live in peace and harmony, but also know that they've been seen and heard. So let's take a minute to think about or write about on your paper um, some of the, your ideas of how we can meet Aunt Nelda's needs and values and how we can satisfy what Uncle Roberto wants and desires. So let's take a minute. And I'm, so I'm gonna ask the Zoomers, um, sharing screen, if you, you can see those needs, to take about three minutes and think of some ideas where we can satisfy all of those needs. None of them are left out. Okay, now we don't have to be finished, but now I'd like you to pair up with someone and share your ideas and maybe combine ideas. What strategies can you think of together to uh, um, satisfy all these values? And I'm going to pair up the people on Zoom. Okay, it's time to wrap it up. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. All right, so I just want, I want to take a, a few minutes and, and just get a, a sense as, as a community, what do we propose as one community as far as meeting these needs? And um, um, Luann, did you want to share some of your ideas? And then we'll... Well, yeah. we decided that it would be good for uh, each person so their uh, need was honored. Nelda got her space, that it was never a question of how orderly it needed to be. She could have full chaos, freedom of expression, and Roberto would have his own space where it was untouched, orderly. And perhaps that they both could get support where she could be in the company of artists to see what they were doing to cope and or an artistic space mark suggested like the maker space where she could take her creativity there and roberto could have some support with having a cleanup person come on a very regular consistent basis so nelda could be completely relieved of her duties hmm. and i was wondering what um um, Sunrise or Virginia, we're, we're talking about? Okay, when we were talking, when Virginia and I were talking about this, I think, this is my impression, you probably have your own, but I think the sum total of what we arrived at is that if, and this is an if, if there were issues, personality issues, where he's more controlling, which isn't clear, Yep, it, so it it's is. possible from that list that he was a controlling person and that his issues might be more related to control than to actual orderliness per se and so i would say that if there were control issues that he would try to 
um, work with that and, and improve or, or whatever that means or use it to the, his own advantage or others advantage and likewise she may have issues that are also control related meaning I don't want control I want more spontaneity which was already on the list anyways yeah. but if if the main issue between them is control or lack of control uh, I think that we were saying maybe that was something that they needed to address. That's what I thought we were saying together. Individually, the very first thing that came to my mind before we talked it was, it, I said to myself, this is a no-brainer, hire a housekeeper. But then I thought, well, there's a, there's a if there, can you afford that? You know, but right, I don't know right. how to solve it if you can't afford it. Um, so number one was hire a housekeeper. And then I thought, well, they could divide the house in half or get a duplex that would cost more money. You know, and each has one side or they could live separately. I know a number of couples who live separately. They have separate houses and they live sometimes at each other's house. But, you know, um, and they're married, but they, they just like to have their own home you know she wants it her way he wants it his way so that's what they do okay. and so i've known many couple many couples who have done that um I, so I, that's why that's what i have to share but virginia yeah. maybe you got something i i, I want to can i i'll time rise um and i hear from both louis and you that there's maybe something else behind that control and they want something else. And so I want to hear from Bella and Dan. But we both agreed on the word acceptance. That was the first word we both agreed on. We have to accept where the other person is at. Now, then what I thought was that then we have to have some, find some point of empathy. In other words, work at putting on the shoes of the other person as to figure out to feel how they feel if something was done to you, maybe in a different area, but the point is the frustration that one feels. And then the third would be compromise, that somewhere they, they are going to have to be open and compromise because the love is there and they both are going to have to look at how important is the distance if they, if they continue each with their own actions is dividing them. So that would be where the compromise would come in. Dan, do you have anything more to add? I, I, I took, as usual, extreme positions. And um, let's say Aunt Nelda is basically a slob all of her life. She's uh, driven to get things done. And so as, as long as uh, the day's list of one to 10 gets accomplished and there's a mess around, uh, so be it. No one's complaining about the mess because I got things done. And uh, so Uncle Roberta is a neat neck. Now he's been that way all of his life. And if he sits around 12 hours a day cleaning up and nothing else gets done in his life, he's perfectly happy. So how do we get these people to make compromises? Well, we agreed the word accept. So I came up um, at the slab, except that one day a week, maybe we do cleaning and checking. And uh, so we can get some order. And the uncle, except that uh, the house uh, will not always be up to his perfect standards, not even a speck of dust on anything. And, uh, and so that's, that's why <laughs> it ended. My first thought was, I, I tend to see my universe as a reflection of myself. So I have to say, if I have a problem with someone, I have to figure out what is my part in it if you want to say it that way. And I use the word compromise, but I think to begin with, you, you have to have a desire to, to trust the universe in the first place, and therefore trust the people in your world. And it, we're, we trust each other here pretty well, because we know each other, we're intimate with each other in some ways. But I think there's a consciousness of, of in the world, we have to know 
that within each of us, there is that loving, compassionate, caring part, even the ones that don't seem that way because they're hiding it under some other thing. Now, if they come up in our life, they got there for a reason, either to strengthen us <laughs> or um, for us to resolve those issues on ourselves. How many times have you seen a parent um, not like one of the children, you know, more than the other, right? And you from the outside can say, you're just like that child. <laughs> that child is just like you. You're, you're uh, projecting each other. So I think it behooves us, and I loved your, um, your speaking today. I thought that was great because it makes me um, see that in a way we have to have enough hope in us to start with love in the first place, to expect it, to look for it, to believe it's there. If we don't believe it's there, we're, not, we're totally in despair. So you have to believe that there is something. And when, and I think in those times when we're, as uh, Abraham would say, when we release, we just release it. You know, it's one of those things like Taylor said, when you say, help me God. You know, you get to that spot where there's no other course of action for survival than to release. And when you do that, then you see that little spark. You see something, you see a kind thing, like my having this young man reach over me when I couldn't reach a Coke bottle I wanted to give to my sister who was in a hospital. And he said, I got your back. And he reached over my head, the only real Coke. That little experience with that other human I didn't know brought me such awareness of the true kindness that dwells in all of us. And it's little things like that that help me know that it isn't just the people in this room. It's the people all over the planet. It's the trees that you were talking about and the little animals. So it's an in and an out experience. But you have to start with the trust. I, what I also want to do is just, I'll give you, just create a, a genuine proposal based on everyone's input to see if you're agreeable, and then I'll provide that to uh, uh, my uncle and aunt. The one aspect that I had not brought up for people for in my life is to realize that my personal needs have impact on another person. I'm not living on an island. So if I were going to consult with them, I would help them realize the impact that they had on each other. OK, um, so when I had said um, that it was a no-brainer, hire a housekeeper if you can afford it, it just occurred to me now that if they could not afford a housekeeper, they could barter, which is they could trade their services for the services of a housekeeper, and there's no exchange of cash whatsoever. So that, that's another solution. Yeah, I spoke with Taylor, and um, it looks like he might have signed off. Uh, Taylor mentioned having her keep her paint brushes in a bucket um, outside of the kitchen. And uh, my thought was for the aunt to have her own art room that they create some separation in their house so that she has places she can do her thing and he has places he can have his way as a kind of a compromise, which is something I somewhat live with as well. Okay. So what I would, I'm going to make a proposal and you can agree or disagree. And if you disagree, just say add this. But I'm going to make a proposal that um, they, they explore separate places and somehow or separate houses or separate rooms in their house but somehow create a way where um, my uncle can have his own space and his tv set in that space and 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 she can have her space whether it's in the house or or uh, her own room or maybe in a different house and so that is 
one solution. The other solution is that they get together and check in more with each other. How is this working for you? And keep that communication going. Because in all cases, I heard it wasn't just about the strategy. It was, you know, everyone was looking at what was, else was going on. Do they need acceptance? Do they need to be heard more? Um, do they need to uh, get some uh, get some help or get some outside feedback, you know, to support? If there's a controlling issue, do they need to look at that? Could this be this issue? Could be an opportunity for them to go deeper with it themselves and say, "Why am I so controlling?" So that might be another option is for them to talk to a therapist once a month or 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 talk about themselves you know, what might be causing that control. So um, how does this sound to you guys? Is this proposal okay? Does anyone want to add anything to it? In some ways, that's as an option. They can explore, um, explore that, you know. So I will make these proposals and now I want to thank you everyone because this is kind of what a community does. We work together on the solution, and the solution is not necessarily the surface problem. It's what's going on. It's what we value that's not being met. And if we can pull that out and see that, then basically a third grader can come up with solutions. And so in conclusion, I want to say, and this is kind of, um, I, I practiced this lesson with Taylor, and he suggested this, so I put it in my conclusion because I thought it was really good. He says that the inward journey alone is lonely if it's just taken by yourself. And to take the inward journey solely by yourself without accompaniment is a lonely affair. So I like the idea that my uncle and I have each other to go inwards with. They can share that journey with each other. And he said, Taylor says, that's why we need each other, that we thrive when we include others in our inward journey. And in that inclusion, that's part of our outward journey. And so one more thing that the Jesus said, I tell you truly that if two of you agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, there I am with them. And so I think that's kind of what we just did, that that collaboration, that pure energy to, to help someone else, that pure energy to, to in some way help ourselves, because we all identified with these same values. Um, that purity is that Christ energy coming through. And so I want to uh, thank everyone for coming here. And now we'll probably briefly close with a song or a tour.